All right, fellas, let's talk about Warhammer 3, or, as I call it, the great big fantasy clusterfrack of 2023. If you're not commanding an army resembling the abominable love child of a Game Workshop's clearance bin and a Renaissance fair, are you even strategizing, bro? Grand Cathay's like that overachiever in your class who brings a laser pointer to a knife fight. Their harmony mechanic is about as balanced as American politics. Bet they call their walls the Great Firewall of Cathay because nothing says privacy policy like a dragon watching your every move. The Demon Prince's customization screen is more detailed than my last three relationships combined. If you can't handle me at my spiky bits, you don't deserve me at my majestic wings. Remember when your parents told you that love is dead? Well, they were wrong. Because the only thing deader than love itself is the power couple of Vlad and Isabella von Karstein. It's like Brangelina. Except, they're both pale, can't stand garlic, and instead of adopting kids, they raise the dead. If you ever felt like your relationship goals were unachievable, try matching these two. They began as a millennial rom-com. A girl meets boy. Girl contracts terminal illness. Boy refuses to bite girl. Girl begs, boy gives in, and boom, undead love story. Let's chat about the devilishly charming Isabella von Karstein. A countess, not only of the night, but of assets and accrued interests. She's like the Elon Musk of Sylvania, if Elon drained blood instead of union spirits. Let's talk about her unique skill, fiscal necromancy, because everyone knows you can trust the living about as far as you can throw their corpses. Now, why wage war when you can just leverage your way to victory? Do you ever feel a sudden chill down your spine? It's just Isabella mortgaging your soul to the highest bidder in the Goldman Sachs bank. Be vigilant with those spectral loans. Folks, the only thing worse than dying in battle is your undead abomination phasing out because you couldn't meet the quarterly financial forecast. Picture this. You log in, give good old Vlad Sylvanian loan shark von Karstein a high-fiver. Wait, do vampires do high-fives? Anyway, you got this boss man Vlad and Isabella's posse because what's better than a vamp? Two vamps, that's what. And these lovebirds stick together thicker than bloodsuckers on a neck vein. So here's my master plan for causing an economic collapse in the name of metagaming. Raise dead? More like raise dead? Yeah, we got this trick called raise dead, and I used it like a credit card with no limit. See, you can pop up an army of undead minions right out of the ground. It's like using the bones of your enemies as collateral. Battlefields aren't just for spilling blood anymore. They're ATM machines for necromancers. Mortgaging souls. I marched this fresh army straight into Dieter, the stickler's yard. His troops looked about as sturdy as my will to live after seeing the steam summer sale prices. And since his army was about as threatening as a kitten with a nerf gun, I took the auto-resolve route like I was declining terms and conditions. Dominating captives for profit. Post-battle, we're not about taking prisoners or setting them free. Nah, we're in it for the dark magic, baby. It's like mining Bitcoin, but instead of GPU, we use ghouls and spirits. Dominating captives is basically hitting the subscribe to my OnlyFangs button, and the dark magic rolls in like ad revenue. So first off, I decided to overclock the heck out of Vlad the Dad von Karstein with the hunger ability because honestly, he's looking a little thin, isn't he? The guy consumes territory like Amazon does small businesses, complete and without remorse. And because here at von Karstein a company, we believe in a diversified portfolio, I decided to annex Eskin faster than Facebook changes its privacy policy. I dropped in and said, beep beep, get in the Uber. We're going for a ride and just like that, Eskin signed a mandatory terms of service agreement with me. Moving on, Castel Drakenhof got gentrified so hard, it started serving avocado toast. A gold mine in the basement, you ask? Yep, unlike Bitcoin, this one has real dividends. We're digging for the shiny stuff because, let's face it, in this economy, who needs a 401k when you've got a literal mountain of gold? And here's where it gets juicy, my friends. Isabella starts dialing up her neighbors faster than a telemarketer at dinner time. She calls up Alberich Hopped Anderson, a guy with more names than sense, and says, Hey, wanna stomp some beastmen and in exchange, you know, maybe overlook any insider trading or embezzlement I'm doing for, let's say, forever. It's called a non-aggression pact, but we all know it's more of a let's make dirty money together kind of deal. And because we're generous like that, we ring up Emperor Carl the Franz. Tighten your pantaloons, Carl, because we're joining your rave against the war herd of the One-Eye. Why? For the heftiest payment of them all. Cold, hard gold, baby. All in the first turn, because in the world of the undead, you either go big or you go home to your coffin. By the end of her capitalist crusade of the first turn, Isabella's sitting on a small mountain of gold coins, probably bathing in it like some sort of undead Scrooge McDuck. Isabella is all about that gold, and boy, she extracts it with the precision of a dental surgeon yanking teeth from a peasant. I threw my shambling zombies at Zelig Van Kruger like they were cheap darts at a bar game, expendable and often missed. But it's all part of the strategy, see? You send in the fodder to soak up damage like a thirsty sponge, then roll out the VIP, the graveguard, cushy high-end vampire units that really get the party started with a massacre. And the Vargolf? That thing is out there doing its best impression of a meat grinder at a butchery convention. 
Gratuitous violence is its middle name and it signs each corpse with a flourish. With Tempelhoffs, armies shredded like an accountant's rejected tax returns, I waltzed over their cities like a repo man seizing assets. Using the raised dead ability faster than pressing the print money button at the Federal Reserve, I conjured another army out of thin air. Because why wait for recruitment when you can just resurrect the freshly dead? The Fort Obersteyer? It crumbled faster than the self-esteem of a balding accountant at a hair growth seminar. And the last city of Tempelhof? Well, Isabella swept through it like a hostile takeover. No survivors, just new real estate for our vampire queen of capital gains. With the Tempelhof faction as dead as my hopes of ever affording a house in this economy, Isabella reigned supreme over northern Sylvania, cementing her status as the undisputed queen of fiscal necromancy and unliving economies. Now let's talk about the blood kisses. They've basically turned the vampire counts into the Kardashians of the Warhammer world, accumulating all this currency from doing. Well, I can't really say on a family-friendly platform, can I? But let's just say they're renowned for their social skills and leave it at that. Then you've got Isabella von Karstein, the queen bee of the night. This chick didn't just get her lami and lip fillers for pecking at peasants. No, she's gone full entrepreneur, spreading her bat wings into the financial sector like she's cosplaying Bernie Madoff, but with less fraud and more involuntary blood donations. Isabella's first hustle. Trading places, which might as well have been called trading corpses, am I right? Basically sees her offering life insurance with a twist. Come with me and live forever, she says, giving you that sultry undead wink as you sign over your mortal soul for a premium membership in her afterlife empire. Goodbye, Eddie Murphy's comedic genius. Hello, eternal servitude in the form of zombified middle management. As she charms her way into the treasuries of unsuspecting fleshy nations, she's collecting vassals like their Pokemon cards. Gotta catch them all. And by catch them, I mean ensnare them into my dark web of blood-sucking bureaucracies. Isabella calls up old Alberich Hopped Anderson from Sterland, promising to help him slap around the deceivers like their little league players. And what do you know? He signs a trade agreement. Now I've got a human vassal hooked on the promise of blood, sweat, equity. Warhammer 3 isn't just about the total war. It's about total market domination. In the grim darkness of the far past, there is only supply and demand. So here's the thing. I went all warmonger on Helmut Furbach of Talabekland, crushed his armies into the dirt where they belong, and when he was down to his last settlement, did I raise it to the ground? Nope. I turned Helmut into my newest underling through the art of economic subjugation by vassalization. That's vassal number two, if you're keeping score. At this point, I'm starting to look less like a vampire countess and more like a wolf of Wall Street. With my new power, I unlock the first level of von Karstein and bloodlines. Gotta spend that sweet blood kiss currency on something useful. But why stop there? I decided it was time to bring the lumber market to its knees, so I waged war on Dryka of the Wargrove of Woe. Sure, her place, Griffin Wood, is habitable for trees, not so much for vampires, but real estate's real estate, and I'm not one to discriminate against the inanimate or the arboreal. My underlings, bunch of unwashed zombies, tanked damage from bears and Dryka's tree friends, while my Vargas swooped down like predatory drones, and the Vargos flanked like, well, very large flanking things. Despite the uninhabitable magic forest climate for vampires, the territory was conquered and I wisely expanded the territories of both myself and my loyal vassals. Down south, the first thing I see is Balthasar Gelt of the Golden Order, gleaming brighter than a Bitcoin investor in 2017. I'm looking to expand my luxury blood spa resort in the southern territories, but old Balthasar and his shiny metal fan club are hogging the best real estate. I try to recruit him into my literal pyramid scheme. No dice. What's a vampy baroness of business to do? Well, if they ain't buying, they're dying. We're not talking hostile takeover. We're talking dead hostile takeover. Balthasar Gelt and his contagiously uncorrupted ways? Wiped from existence. His puritanical fiscal conservatism was no match for my Zuckerberg of zombie tactics. Now you can't trash the competition without ruffling some beard. And sure enough, Thorgrim got all grumpy and called for economic sanctions, also known as declaring war. This beardy brokers ranked 8 in the Fortune 500 of the old world. Meanwhile, I was sitting pretty at rank 3, about to teach him that the market's a battleground. Realizing that outsourcing is key to any growing enterprise, I needed a vassal to watch my southern border while I penned hostile takeover letters. Now the dwarves, they're a little traditional, didn't catch the crypto boom. So they weren't buying what I was selling, especially with Thorgrim's sell all vampire stocks campaign. But in the cutthroat economy of the old world, you can always find an opportunist. Enter Snorko Oli Weirdy of Creeping Death, a one-settlement wonder with an eye for expansion and eyeballs deep in warfare with dwarves. I tossed him a once in an unlife offer, the lands of the eastern border princes, erstwhile property of the ex-golden order. And just like that, I've got myself a vassal, proof that with the right leverage buyouts, you can move the world. 
or at least trick someone else into guarding it for you while you plot domination over a glass of the finest AB negative on the market. Relationships in total war are as stable as the cryptocurrency market. Take Eben von Leibwitz of Wissenland, a man so stubborn not even a positive Yelp review would sway him to join my corporate empire as a vassal. He's like one of those indie game devs trying to say no to an EA buyout. Gotta admire the spirit, but we all know how that story ends, with a special edition day one DLC that's just dying to drain your wall. To vassalize him, I've gotta punch through Reekland, but just when I was about to go full Carlos Ghost and on Reekland, Belagar Ironhammer of Clan Angron comes knocking. And by knocking, I mean declaring war out of nowhere. It's convenient, though. Not because I like killing dwarves, which I totally do, but because kicking their mountainous butts gives me a shortcut to my green-skinned vassals lounging in the eastern border prince's region. Belagar, bless his mountain-forged heart, wouldn't even talk about peace when he was down to his last settlement. No hard feelings, just business as I demolish his faction off the map. With the Black Mountain secured, it's time to circle back to our friends in Reekland. Time to show them that, in the world of Warhammer 3, economic downturns aren't a bug, they're a feature, and I'm the hedge fund manager from hell, ready to exploit it. Because when everything else fails, cash, coercion, and crypts make for excellent leverage. It's go time, Reekland. So, there's me prepping for financial and literal Armageddon against Reekland, when suddenly, I get slapped with a mission. Blood Chalice of Bathory. Smells like a plot device to power up my already morally questionable entrepreneurship skills. The plan is to bolster an already terrifying army with the winged, nightmare-inducing terrorgeist. Buffed to high heaven by Isabella's flying horror skill. Fancy talk for air support by things that shouldn't fly. Both Isabella and Vlad von Karstein hit level 40 at this point, making them about as fair and balanced as a 1990s Russian election. Teleporting to the battle, I square up against Theodoric Feuerbach of the Empire Expedition, big name for a small threat. The battle was easier than convincing a bunch of orcs to bath in blood. It's their favorite pastime. The result? A performance so one-sided we lost less than the fine print on a loan contract. After laying the smack down, I secure an upgraded blood chalice of Bathory, because nothing complements a genocidal campaign like a nice chalice. Oh, and in case there was any doubt in your mind about my in-game war crime spree, I've got enough blood kisses to wake the Necrarch from his dusty coffin in the bloodlines. It's like rewarding yourself for all that economic destruction with a nice vampire power nap. All right, strap yourselves in, here comes the boom. Having booted the dwarves to the Underworld's customer service and snagging that juicy blood chalice of Bathory, it's finally time for the main event against Reekland. See, this isn't just a hostile takeover. It's about sending a message. Our checklist is short but sweet. Make Wissenland bow down and kiss the ring and snatch Altdorf's keys. Altdorf's like owning the penthouse suite at Trump Tower, only it's the occupied Imperial Palace, and instead of gold toilets, you get diplomatic swag and a VIP pass to totalitarian rule. Now, you can't just flood Reekland with angry shareholders. They've tied the knot with six other factions, including a cold marriage with Kislev. So, we play dirty and sideswipe Wissenland, knowing full well Reekland will jump in to defend its damsel in distress. Midway through the corporate slaughter, the war host of the apocalypse gets jealous and hits me with a declaration of war. Talk about uninvited guests, but we've got more pressing matters like squashing Reekland's ambitions under our boot. Remember those fancy high-tier units I mentioned? Oh yeah, they chewed through Reekland's defenses like a termite with a vendetta. We turned their heartland into a car park and even managed to sell a timeshare to Theodoric Gasser of Nordland. Add him to the collection. That makes four vassals under my benevolent despotism. And Reekland? Officially part of history's dustbin. Get this. The Black Pyramid of Nagash is up for grabs. And who better to snatch it than me, the one vampire to rule them all, on the old world real estate market. So I packed my bags, or rather had my undead minions pack them for me, and we set sail to the Southlands. Destination, domination. It's time to teach the Sentinels a lesson in hostile acquisitions. Here's where things get cheeky. We let the Sentinels play their game, conquering settlements like they're collecting Monopoly properties. They thought they had Volkmar, the grim of the cult of Sigmar cornered, but surprise, we swoop in like a corporate bailout and offer a deal he can't refuse. Become a vassal in exchange for a reclaimed settlement. And would you believe it? The dude who hates vampires more than garlic bread agrees. I guess the pen really is mightier than the stake. Next, we cross paths with the Drakenhof Conclave, a group of like-minded undead entrepreneurs. A quick timeshare pitch later, and Manfred von Karstein is vassal number six, our latest franchisee in the Southlands. When it was time to short-squeeze the Sentinels, Isabella did it with the finesse of a hedge fund manager orchestrating a market crash. Suddenly, it's all tendies raining from the sky as the vultures circle and Isabella economic engine goes The Sentinels had numbers, sure, but we had strategy and an insatiable hunger for conquest. One by one, their armies fell until the grand prize the Black Pyramid of Nagash was mine. The Sentinels' brief stint as a regional power? Cancelled. In the end, the Black Pyramid turns into the corporate HQ of Vamcorp, 
probably the only place where the pension plan is eternal life and the health benefits cover regeneration from total dismemberment. With six vassals wrapped around our finger and the bloodline lords throwing their weight behind us, Isabella stands unassailable, a juggernaut of fiscal force and undead might. So, there you have it, a classic tale of vampire romance and financial irresponsibility, all in a day's work in Warhammer 3. Remember boys, Vlad and Isabella are our power couple gold. And remember, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. Thanks for attending my TED Talk on Dark Economics. Now go bankrupt some peasants for their life savings. Or, as I like to call it, Tuesday. Later.